Lolita, light of my life, fire of my loins, my sin, my soul, lo li Okay, <laughs> so from the first line, we're introduced to the theme and concept of the novel, that of romanticism, limerence, obsession, and the general feverish nature of love, as well as the understanding that love is actually a religious thing. My sin, my soul. Notice how sin and fire are next to one another, i.e. hell and that light and life are on the either side of that. Meaning really that love encapsulates all, including evil. Yes, nuance is a critical thing when it comes to literature, so there'll be no dichotomous thinking here. The essence of the deific is also to be taken note of, but we will get to that um, a bit more later. Whilst I don't think there's much else to say about the opening line, I do think it's worth noting that, aside from Lolita, the word my is repeated four times. My life, my loins, my sin, my soul. Which indicates already just how the story is really about the perspective of the not-so-humble Humbert Humbert, so perverted Nabokov named him twice, and his grandiose narcissism and the self-absorbed obsession that he has for Lolita, and not about Lolita, or should I say Dolores, at all. Which leads me to the second line. Lo-li-ta. The tip of the tongue taking a trip of three steps down the palate to tap at three on the teeth, lo, li, ta. Notice how he's morphing and playing with a name of his very own design. I do think that this is intentional because it somewhat circumvents your general suspicions, as we're gonna soon learn, like he's already metamorphosed the name of Dolores into Lolita, and now he's cutting the very name of Lolita apart and reducing her to nothing but syllables, which is kind of metaphorical of her body, um, and if not the novel as a whole. Lolita. And in all honesty, if you did come across someone who pronounced every syllable of your name, you'd likely think that he or she was a lunatic, <laughs> or actually a child, um, which I do think is quite telling um, from what I've watched of like Sam Vaklin. He has often said that the narcissist really at his core is a child. So I kind of suspect that Nabokov had premonitory um, psychological insights when it comes to this novel, just to add to my sheer amazement and admiration of the whole piece. But for argument's sake, we are dealing with a psychopathic lunatic. <laughs> but again, I mean, just to couple the meaning a bit, lunacy is what love is capable of bringing out of all of us. Uh, never mind vengeance or greed, revenge. Love will make you rip the world apart. And I do believe that that's what we let Humbert Humbert somewhat off the hook for because really we know each one of us, regardless of the circumstances, are at the mercy of this from time to time, or have been throughout our lifetimes, if we're willing to concede it. Next, we're not only given a taste of the style and prose of the novel, but what I think is Nabokov giving us a little bit of ASMR inside our own heads. The tip of the tongue taking a trip of three steps down the palate to tap at three on the teeth. I mean, Humbert might as well be kissing you from the inside out at this point. Some might even say without your consent. But to which you are nonetheless at the complete mercy of. 
And you can't help but imagine the tip of the tongue taking a trip. And I don't think trip is there by any accident whatsoever, uh, considering that later on down the line of the novel, or down the road, if you will, um, we are on a road trip of sorts, uh, where a foreign man is traveling about the mesmerizing aspects of the United States of America. But I think the word, just that word trip, I think it's just little, like little seed is planted there because this is kind of like a spell in a lot of ways, if I was to conclude it with anything, like the whole thing is kind of not only intoxicating you, but putting you under the allure of a kind of drug. And if love is anything, <laughs> it is a drug. I don't think three steps is by any accident either, because it, it does sound somewhat childish, or at least it reminds me or has connotations of first steps, i.e. baby steps. Um, there's something kind of virginal about it. Down the palate to tap at three on the teeth. Lo, li, ta. Though I think it's more lo, mm, li, mm, ta. Mm. <laughs> she was low, plain low, in the morning, standing four feet ten in one sock. She was Lola in slacks. She was Dolly at school. She was Dolores on the dotted line. But in my arms, she was always Lolita. She was low, plain low is an interesting one. I'm not quite sure why he would use plain, though I suppose it does give an idea of the kind of domesticated life and could potentially be a foreshadowing of like the kind of time before the mother dies. Um, also standing four feet ten in one sock, obviously that's the first time we do learn that who he's talking about is actually a child. Um, but the one sock I, I do find intriguing, like especially the more you know about this novel, the more horrific it does seem. So I get the idea that is it her in say her school clothes but with just one sock on or pajamas perhaps or is she naked and just wearing the one sock after having been ravaged because of Humbert Humbert's lack of instinctual control <laughs> I mean this this is the novel we're dealing with you know I'm not trying to gross anyone out too much but yeah given the subject matter <laughs> I didn't write it I'm just saying that much okay she was Lola in slacks. She was Dolly at school. She was Dolores on the dotted line. But in my arms, she was always Lolita. She was Lola in slacks, a kind of casual kind of wear. Lola also being somewhat of a kind of prostitute's name, or at least fantastical, femme fatale, nymphette type of name. She was Dolly at school. I think Dolly is the most obvious one, um, but I do think that there's a really sad irony with that, because at school was probably where Dolores could actually be herself, or the only place she could ever be herself. But ironically, outside of it, she is a doll um, to Humbert or later becomes like a complete plaything for him. Um, so I think that is also, you know, another clever usage there. <laughs> and she was Dolores on the dotted line. Uh, it makes it quite clinical. But first I have to mention how Dolor means pain, grief, great mental anguish, suffering, which not only describes their experiences as individuals, but also their experience in the relationship. And just to top that all off, it also encapsulates the novel as well. I mean, this is how goddamn good the introduction and the whole book really is. I mean, it's it's phenomenal. On the dotted line, I think is 
intentionally clinical, but also warming you up for the next part. Um, but before that, but in my arms, she was always Lolita. But in my head, in my hands, in my possession, she was always Lolita. Because Dolores has no say about becoming Lolita. But also, not only does Dolores metamorphose into Lolita, but Dolores's surname is Hayes, <laughs> which, I mean, it's just too fucking good because it's just like, yeah, that's also indicating just how blurred um, and rose-tinted Humber Humbert's perception of her really is. It's just, ah, it's beyond, and also the kind of druggy element as well of like his infatuation. It's just everything within it like to be in a haze is uh yeah i mean there isn't many writers who could compete with that except perhaps for edgar Allan poe i would say and this is a really cheap segue into that part of the <laughs> into that part of the piece so let's do that now did she have a precursor she did, indeed she did. In point of fact, there might have been no Lolita at all had I not loved, one summer, a certain initial girl child in a Princeton by the Sea. In a Princeton by the Sea is the obvious reference um, to the Edgar Allan Poe poem, Annabelle Lee. But this is also a way of alluding to not only the style and lyricism or grandiloquence of the prose itself, but also another piece of foreshadowing where if you do know the poem, you'll realise that even the name Annabelle Lee is taken. This is the first girl that he claims is when uh, his perversions took root. And also, but before I get to that, um, I actually think this is a usage of double consciousness because it's not only Humbert Humbert playfully or somewhat deceptively telling you that there may have been no Lolita at all had it not been for Annabelle Lee, which is the story he's about to get to. But I think Nabokov is also telling you as the reader that there probably wouldn't have been any Lolita had it not been for Edgar Allan Poe's Annabelle Lee. Oh, when? About as many years before Lolita was born as my age was that summer. You can always count on a murderer for a fancy prose style. So here, I mean, again, really, um, what Humbert Humbert is doing is deliberately convoluting what he's telling you in order to disarm um, your critical thinking, I would say, overall. He's trying to make you associate Lolita's age with his own, as if it were the same thing. And when we look at Edgar Allan Poe's poem, Annabelle Lee, we see, I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabelle Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And make particular note of, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. Another curious fact, Edgar Allan Poe, at the modest age of 27, married his first cousin, who was 13. Uh, so we've already got another weird, like, crossover re reality with fiction and all that type of thing. So there's so many, so much overlap here that you're just like already being kind of indoctrinated yourself, especially in terms of like your unreliability, which will increase the more that you are besotted, seduced and intoxicated by Humbert Humbert's language skills and charm, um, which also have the drug effect of, you guessed it, love. If I was to nitpick, I would say that the fancy prose style 
is slightly off, like very, very minutely. I mean, it still works, but I think it's the only one that does kind of throw you off slightly. Um, of course, it is a piece of foreshadowing. We're learning everything we need to know. And that's what the aim of the first or the opening of a novel uh, should be, uh, when it comes to literature, at least. But again, the fancy prose style is also alluding to Edgar Allan Poe, or at least the style in which Lolita is going to be written, uh, that kind of gothic uh, horror romanticism, let's say. Of course, Edgar Allan Poe being so influential in that um, genre that you kind of, even that is there. <laughs> like it's, it's just kind of like, how, how many things can keep overlapping? Um, which actually does lead me to... Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, exhibit number one is what the seraphs the misinformed, simple, noble-winged seraphs envied. Look at this tangle of thorns. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, so um, I'm back to that point about the clinical element of it. Obviously, this is a bit facetious, I would say. I, mean, I think he's just being somewhat comical with this. But as he says, um, exhibit number one is what the seraphs the misinformed, simple, noble-winged Ceres envied. Again, that's a direct reference to Edgar Allan Poe's poem. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. The poem as well was actually published after Poe's death, which I find quite intriguing, especially given that Lolita is largely to do with death. But the Seraphs, it's interesting to note, were actually like the most powerful angels in the Bible. Um, they weren't mentioned too much, I don't believe, but yeah, they, they were angels that had to take a lot of action as well. So the nod to Poe is obvious, but what I think Humbert Humbert's doing here is is basically kind of displaying the kind of black humour of the piece because, you know, he's saying that they're just idiotic when really they're the most powerful types of angels. Um, so he's, yeah, he's playing with you a little. But getting back to the clinical element, exhibit number one, um, I find that a very intriguing way of addressing who he's talking about because on Reddit, I, I saw quite a few people seem to think that exhibit number one was Lolita, but I don't really see how that can be the case uh, at all, in all honesty. I can only see it being one of two. The memoir itself being exhibit number one, but what I really think it means is that Annabelle Lee, is, which is the story we're about to go on to, is the object. And of course, that's the way Humber Humbert sees not only Lolita, because she is Annabelle Lee incarnate, but it's probably the only time that Humbert Humbert actually slips up slightly in this opening passage, because he is giving away the fact that he objectifies, he sees them not for what they really are, as quite literally an inanimate piece of evidence and whatnot. So I find that a very intriguing one where you, I do think part of his shadow really slips, um, unbeknownst to even himself, I, I could imagine as well. Look at this tangle of thorns. And then finally, the deific reference, which I mentioned earlier, is actually bookended here. Look at this tangle of thorns. So not only does it have the connotations of the religious, i.e. Jesus Christ being forced to wear a crown of thorns, mockingly so, um, moments before he's about to be crucified. But what it also seems to give rise to is, is he talking about the memoir? Um, is that the tangle of thorns in which he to which he refers? Or is he the monster within the piece who's left with nothing but a tangle of thorns? Because in plant mythology, the thorns and thistles and things like that, they're, they're there to, to uh, deter an animal from eating it. So is the plant, uh, or Lolita, which is quite a flowery type of name, I, I would say, is she the flower in this instance? And is it 
is Humber Humber admitting that after he's consumed her all, all he's left with is a tangle of thorns? Or did the plant, i.e. Lolita, get away and is he just left with this tangle of thorns? Like there's a kind of there's a it's a real mixture of what could be really said about that phrase or what he was actually referring to. And yeah, well, I mean, if this video didn't convince you that Lolita or the opening of Lolita is the daddy of lit, then please feel free to contradict me. I'd love to see something that could even touch how perfect this really is. I mean, you're already slightly confused but seduced by the poetry and lyricism and grandiloquence of the prose. You're set up, you, you have been foreshadowed, you know he's a murderer, you know he's talking about a child, you know that there's a trip down the line of the novel. Um, you also know what style the novel's going to be told in, what type of dark humour, which is something I think the modern reader doesn't appreciate enough. It's very funny, like especially given a tongue-in-cheek kind of vibe where he's playing with language so much that it does become comical and especially in regard to the horror that is within it, it's like you can't help but find it amusing just because of how goddamn shocking it really is. Obviously everything to do with Edgar Allan Poe, he pays homage to him um, and was and Nabokov I think is showing his admiration. It's very um, respectful of the man whilst also being somewhat comical about his own history and things like that so and then I don't know there's other, all the other stuff that I mentioned the way he plays with words and how his dissection of the very name is also <clears throat> symbolic and metaphorical of what he does to Lolita it's uh, it's it's just uh, it's a masterpiece um, thank you very much for watching <laughs>